I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm the editor of National Affairs, um, a new quarterly journal of essays on the range of domestic policy challenges we face. Uh, this morning's discussion is sponsored jointly by National Affairs and by City Journal, uh, the wonderful quarterly magazine of the Manhattan Institute, which is not only the nation's premier urban policy journal, but has been an absolutely essential source of insight on the financial crisis of the last few years. And that's our subject this morning, uh, the American economy and especially the financial system, which has suffered some tremendous shocks in recent years and which is now the subject of a burning policy debate uh, here in Washington. We'll talk about the sources of the crisis. We'll talk about how the system is doing today, uh, whether the kinds of regulatory reform being talked about in Congress literally today uh, would help or hurt. This is an issue that, um, unlike many in Washington, is one that even Washingtonians want to know more about the substance rather than just the politics. We want to understand what's going on. What you hear most from people uh, when you talk to them about the financial regulatory debate is that they just don't know what the issues are and how to understand them. Uh, and they are, in fact, very complicated, very difficult, and very important. And here to help us think through them this morning uh, is one of the brightest stars in the constellation of contemporary uh, economic analysts and writers, Nicole Gelinas uh, of the Manhattan Institute. Nicole is the Searle Freedom Trust Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. She writes on urban economics, uh, on municipal and corporate finance, on business issues. She is also a chartered financial analyst, a member of the New York Society of Securities Analysts. And before coming to City Journal, she was a business journalist for Thompson Financial in New York. Um, she writes regularly for the New York Post. She's published uh, everywhere from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to uh, Crane's New York Business, National Review. And her book, uh, the cover of which you see behind us, uh, After the Fall, Saving Capitalism from Wall Street and Washington, was published last year by Encounter Books. She was also the author of an important essay in the winter issue of National Affairs entitled Too Big Not to Fail, uh, which tried to think through the causes of the crisis and the way forward on regulation. We'll begin today by having Nicole lay out some opening thoughts for us. Uh, then I'll ask her a few questions. And then we'll open it up for all of you to ask her a few questions and see how the conversation goes. So Nicole, please. Good morning. Thank you, Yuval. And it's an honor to be in national affairs uh, next to writers like James Q. Wilson. Uh, hopefully, no one will notice that I'm not as distinguished <laughs> as, uh, as some of these other writers. And I should say, Yuval is my second favorite editor. Uh, Brian Anderson <laughs> from City Journal is, uh, is over here uh, as well. And it's always an honor, of course, it goes without saying, to be in uh, City Journal. So I will give you my uh, quick and sad history of modern finance. And then uh, we, can, we can talk about this. Uh, Senator Dodd's uh, Restoring American Financial Stability Act is a wonderfully detailed and thought out solution to the wrong problem. This, this is a solution to a problem of failed market capitalism. And market capitalism did not fail us in this crisis. What failed us was state capitalism. And unfortunately, this bill, uh, if and when it, it passes in its current form, will just represent a doubling down of all of the mistakes that Washington has made in its approach to the financial sector over two and a half decades. It's going to create more mistakes of state capitalism. And we have been very lucky to get out of this disaster uh, coming to the brink of depression and spending, spending and committing trillions upon trillions of dollars to avoid depression. We will be very lucky if we get out of the next uh, uh, crisis uh, with, with such a result, unfortunately. So why is this uh, crisis not a failure of free markets? Uh, this is a failure of the government's, the, the government failing to understand what the government's role is in free markets, and particularly in the financial system, which has a unique place in the economy. The government needs to treat it uniquely. We learned 
what the government's role is in the financial system 80 years ago in the Great Depression. We learned that the, the government has a few things to do to protect the economy from the fallout of financial industry mistakes, but without protecting the financial industry itself from the consequences of those mistakes. And that was a tricky endeavor. We did figure it out, more or less. With the regulated banking industry, which was back then responsible for the nation's supply of, of credit, very important, obviously, because if you don't have credit, you don't have business investments, you don't have payroll, and so forth. We learned bad banks have to have a way to fail. Uh, they need market discipline. Lenders to bad banks have to lose their money, but you cannot have bank failures that results in mass panic and economic uh, disaster. So what did we have? We had the FDIC uh, created in, in 1933. Uh, it was a very elegant compromise to this problem. Only small depositors would be protected. This was considered and still is considered a, a social good that people need a place to put their money where they don't want to take risk and not a lot of money, just a few years uh, worth of income and savings. But everyone else who had lended or invested in the bank would, would lose their money. And this system worked uh, more or less for 50 years until the, the 1980s. And I'll talk about how that began to erode in, in a few moments. The other part of what we learned in, in the 1930s was humility on the investment side. And I'll, just, I'll read you one quote uh, very quickly to give you an idea of how confident uh, the investment world was in the late 1920s. Uh, this comes from the uh, public relations officer at the New York Stock Exchange in the late 1920s. And he told bankers about the idea of borrowing money from the bank to invest in the stock market. He said, it is a fair statement that the increasing popularity enjoyed by these types of loans is due to the growing recognition that no safer investment exists. There is not a single instance of a loss suffered by lenders within the memory of those engaged in the handling of this type of loan. So, you know, based on this idea that there did not have to be any room for error in borrowing against the stock market, almost no cash cushion down against this type of lending because a mistake was simply inconceivable. Uh, investors, including you know, regular mom and pop investors, big banks, almost everyone, they borrowed against every last dollar that they projected that would be earned out 20, 30 years into the future. So if you had just the slightest wavering in profits, you cannot repay this debt. So you, you, you take out uh, one uh, uh, piece of the pyramid at the bottom and the whole thing just, just fell apart. And that is exactly what happened. And what did the government learn from all of the hearings and everything else that came out of the 1930s disaster? It was not that the bankers were criminals or bad people. It really, in the end, was that they had not known what they were doing any more than anyone else had. And that was the right lesson to learn because we got limits that the government effectively said, we cannot pick out what kind of investments are risky, what kind of investments are not risky. So when it comes to the stock market, you can only borrow 50% of the price of a stock. And what did that do? It, it was another elegant uh, compromise here because it meant that people, investors, financial institutions, uh, could go out and make mistakes, invest, lose their money, but they cannot lose so much money that they bankrupted the entire financial system and resulted in yet more economic catastrophe that would require either depression or inevitable uh, bailouts is, is the choice that we've made uh, in, in more modern days. And, and this, this was uh, d distinguished the rules for the stock market for the investment world. This was kept separate from the traditional world of, of banking. And you had a clear divide where what is the economy's kind of utility stores of credit that have to be protected, and what is the investment world where you can still go out and be freewheeling and make terrible decisions and great decisions and get rich and become poor, but not take down the rest of the economy in doing that. So these, these rules worked well, more or less, until the 1980s. And in the 80s, uh, the financial worlds began to evolve in ways that escape these rules. Uh, 1984, for example, we got our first too big to fail bank. This is when the term entered the financial industry lexicon, where you had 
the eighth largest bank in the nation, a bank called Continental Oil out of Chicago, began to teeter. Uh, there was market panic in early 1984. Some of these headlines, they would seem uh, familiar today. People were worried that this bank was depending on a, a new or a, a, a relatively new type of market, global money markets. They did not borrow uh, as much of their money from insured depositors who would not pull out their money in a panic, but rather they borrowed their money from global investors who lent this money on an overnight basis. So at the slightest hint of a panic, these investors or these lenders could pull out their money. Uh, the government worried that the investors would not distinguish between or among good banks and bad banks, that if Continental went down, these short-term lenders took losses. Other lenders, to protect their own investments, would just yank all of their money from the financial system all at once. Uh, why was such a panic uh, kind of inevitable at Continental Illinois? Because it had also started to invest in relatively, to, re relatively new markets called securitization markets, where it did not hold loans on its books for 30 years and book the profit slowly over time. It bought securitized loans, which were credit facilities, but they acted more like stocks. So you had the panic that you see in the stock market once in a while, but here it was in the debt markets. You've got the more potential for panic on that side, on how it structured its loans, and then more potential for panic on how it funded these loans by relying on global investors. Now, these were signs that the financial industry was changing, that the nation's store of credit was becoming more vulnerable to panic, that we needed to rethink uh, exactly how we regulated the system to, to keep these uh, delicate balances uh, in, in line, that, uh, that the financial system was beginning to erode market discipline. And instead, the fateful mistake in hindsight that the government made was just to uh, kind of anesthetize the problem. Uh, the Reagan administration, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC said, we're not going to let any of these, this bank's lenders fail. Uh, we're just going to protect the bondholders. They won't take their losses, and we'll stop the problem right there. And small bank lobbyists were apoplectic about this. You had a small bank uh, lobbyist in, in the mid-'80s as the government was still trying to work through what it had done. Uh, you had the controller of the currency, one of the bank regulators, go before Congress and say, we would never let any of the top 11 banks in the nation fail. And you had the Independent uh, uh, Bankers Association, the small bank lobby, saying, you are creating too big to fail banks that will be immune for market discipline, and eventually the buck is going to stop at the, at, with the taxpayer. And unfortunately, you know, Congress debated this in a very slow fashion for half a decade. It came up with some window dressing rules that did not address the problem. You had a confirmation of this new policy of bailing out lenders to big banks that, that took hold over the next decade, where in the SNL crisis, big banks, Bank of New England was one, their big sophisticated creditors were protected by the government from losses, whereas small banks went under, their lenders took losses. What did this do? Just as you subsidize, Washington subsidizes, uh, say, corn production with massive subsidies and guarantees. You subsidize corn, you get more corn. You subsidize reckless lending to big financial institutions, and you get more reckless lending to big financial institutions, which is exactly what we got before we started this 25-year uh, cycle of protecting these sophisticated creditors to banks the proportion of debt that the financial industry had borrowed, this was around 20% of the nation's gross domestic product. Now it is over 100%, and a lot of that is due to this government subsidy of lending at banks. And this also had pernicious effects throughout the rest of the financial sector. Uh, smaller banks, investment banks, they did not enjoy this protection. And what did they do? Investment banks had to become ever more creative to keep up with the commercial banks that, that did enjoy this protection. And uh, investment banks, uh, because lending had become a commodity, uh, they could not compete anymore on what had been their old business, you know, advising firms, uh, 
not putting much of their own capital at risk. But the big commercial banks now, they had all of this cheap capital that they could put at risk. They kind of overwhelmed the investment bank's old business model, and the investment banks started doing uh, exotic derivatives, these credit default swaps that we see today, things that became ever more complex and also eroded the government's old system of market discipline. Investment banks uh, partly, and there are other reasons for this, but one of the reasons for coming up with these opaque financial instruments like credit default swaps, other types of derivatives, was that the banks could make a much higher profit margin on these products. Why could they make a higher profit margin? Because they did not trade on a public marketplace. Uh, it, the, this was like hoarding of information. The, the investment world knew if you customize every single derivative instrument so it does not look like any other derivative instrument, the banks have all the information. Customers cannot compare pricing data, volume data. They're stuck going to the investment banks for, you know, they're dependent on them for, for almost everything. That was great, but it added, for the banks, but it added tremendous risks to the financial system that regulators had no idea. If you're not trading financial instruments on old-fashioned exchanges, where you have limits on borrowing that came out of the 1930s, you don't have those limits on borrowing, you don't see the volumes, you don't see the data, there's no central organization that can see is there an AIG that is taking on half a trillion dollars worth of liabilities without putting any money down? That means when you have a financial panic, people do what they started to do in 1984, which is pull their money out of the entire financial system all at once because they have no idea when a company like AIG has made you know, these promises that it cannot pay without putting any cash down under the old-fashioned regulations. They don't know whose bankruptcy AIG in turn is going to bankrupt and whose bankruptcy that bank's uh, going under in turn is going to bankrupt. So you have cascading panic across the system. You have investors pulling their money and then you have inevitable bailouts just to save the economy from the failing financial system. Now, we know exactly uh, how to fix this problem. It's uh, exactly what we did back in the 1930s. We, we've got to we've got to solve a problem with too much complexity, too much opacity, and no market discipline with market discipline and simplicity. The simplicity part is, is very simple. Uh, go back to these old limits on borrowing where it, no matter what kind of derivative you are trading, no matter how safe that you can convince your regulators that this particular investment is, you are the smartest bank in the world, you have eliminated all risk, you've still got to put down a certain percentage of capital behind that, that instrument. And what does that do? It means that when you fail, there's a cash cushion there to protect the rest of the economy from your failure. People know where the risk lies and you have uh, some panic, some rumbling, but it is not to the extent that you have to see these mass scale trillion dollar bailouts. Putting these exotic uh, financial instruments, which are only exotic and that they escape the old rules, putting these things onto exchanges solves uh, at least half of your too big to fail problem. This is where too big to fail is. You don't fix it by doing what the Dodd bill would do, which is tr more state capitalism. We are trying to end too big to fail by decree. The government is saying in th in that it's going to end too big to fail. Uh, making a big show of it, but just like the, the old uh, Soviet Union could not decree business success from the top down, you have to create the conditions for business success. You cannot decree financial industry failure from the top down. You've got to create the conditions for that failure, and that means going back to the old-fashioned rules. That's on the security side. On the banking side, we need modern rules for modern markets here as well, but the goal is the same as it was in the 1930s. Now that these, these banks have become much more dependent on short-term markets for their financing, they, have to have, they should have to have higher cash cushions on their, their books the more that they go out and borrow in the short-term market. So if a bank is borrowing uh, multi-hundred billion or trillion dollars in short-term overnight markets, it has to put more cash down proportionate to that type of, of borrowing. So you are using gentle market forces 
to direct the financial industry in ways that mean that financial companies can fail without taking down the rest of the economy uh, uh, with them. And what do these things do ultimately? As soon as, there's a reason why the only thing that the financial industry cares about in this Dodd bill is derivatives. The, the, the big banks in now the investment world know that as long as they can keep these unregulated derivatives and thread risk throughout the system, they will keep too big to fail. So what does fixing this problem do? This is the only signal that the markets will understand that the industry can withstand financial industry failure. And then you will once again have the situation that held before the 1980s where lenders to these financial institutions know that they risk losses and they risk losses through credible, uh, consistent bankruptcy process, not through arbitrary bailouts and then they will take steps to protect themselves and you will see the financial industry shrink once these subsidies uh, go away. It, it quadrupled as a percentage of the economy from the 80s until today. It probably won't shrink back down to the level that it was in the 80s, but it certainly uh, likely will shrink when these government guarantees go away. And that in turn, and I'll conclude with this, that is not necessarily a bad thing for the rest of the economy. Right now, the financial world is not doing its job, which is support the rest of the economy, uh, determine which uh, investments or investment ideas should get the world's capital, uh, which, and on what terms, uh, what interest rate to compensate for the risk and so forth. Right now the financial industry is not doing that. It is competing with the rest of the economy. You have a financial industry that has this permanent too big to fail subsidy and if you are an investor looking to buy a bond in a blue chip company, you're going to prefer to put your money in a Citigroup or Goldman Sachs not in a tech company or some other company that provides value to the economy. This is an unfair subsidy and it does not come from free market uh, forces. And this, this has also caused uh, or helped to cause a lot of the other issues that we've seen over the past 25 years. For example, income inequality, particularly at the very top where CEO, CEOs now make so much more than the average worker. Well, that is partly because these too big to fail financial firms have all of this borrowed money based on this government subsidy. They can go out and make such tremendous profits that they can pay their people at the top much more than a free market would allow them to. And if you're running an engineering company or an oil company or a tech company, you've got to pay up too so that you can attract uh, what is considered the best talent from the best, best schools. So all of these subsidies that we really have not even seen have threaded themselves uh, so thoroughly throughout the financial system and the economy that it seems almost un inconceivable sometimes that we can get rid of them. But we certainly, we don't have to live with them. We did not live with them until the 1980s. It will take a long time for markets to understand that the financial industry is once again subject to market discipline. But saying that it is too difficult to do and not trying to do it, that just brings us much greater problems down the road. And eventually, markets will work. They tried to work in 2008 in, in saying that this government-supported uh, financial system was built on a failed business model and was untenable. The next time that we see this, the financial industry may create a crisis that is so big that it overwhelms the government's ability to, to bail it out. Uh, the government just simply will not be able to borrow and commit the amount of money that it has done in, in this crisis without paying uneconomic interest rates. And that will be markets working, but this is a case where I would rather that the political process work before the markets uh, work. And uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, open it up to discussion. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, Stephen Moore of the Wall Street Journal is hoping to join us this morning, but isn't able to. And so we'll just begin uh, with a few questions from me, and then we'll open it up uh, to all of you. I wonder first, Nicole, if you can, if you can clarify something about too big to fail, mm -hmm. something which you talk about a lot in the book and which you talked about here. Is it your sense that the executives of these large financial firms in fact explicitly had the expectation that the government would be there and bail them out and made their decisions that way? I mean, some of these large firms did go down, Lehman, Washington Mutual and others, 
Um, do you think that their executives made the decisions they made simply assuming that the government would step in and that the moral hazard was actually explicit in the system in their thinking? Do we have evidence of that? Or is there a reason to think that that's actually how they thought so that too big to fail was in fact the reigning logic in the financial system? I think it's even more subtle and even more pernicious than that in, in many ways that these, the executives of first large banks and then the investment world uh, as the 1990s progressed, uh, we saw our first bailout of a, a hedge fund in 1998 which showed the heads of the investment banks that if the Federal Reserve was too scared to see a hedge fund that had taken and spread all of these risks through the unregulated derivatives markets, if the government was too afraid to see this go under, that they would never let an investment bank go under. But I don't think it is, I mean, the executives could clearly read the papers. They saw the same warnings that we were creating too big to fail financial system. Uh, you know, you, you had people like uh, James Grant, Ron Chernow, all throughout the late 80s and 90s making these warnings that the, the, we were creating a much bigger crisis down the, world, the, down the road. But I don't think that these executives thought uh, to themselves, gee, I'm going to blow up my company because the government will come along and bail me out. And they certainly never said to their lenders, uh, come lend us money because uh, we are too big to fail. That's our claim to fame. But it was more that the lenders to the financial industry uh, knew that they had this uh, market subsidy, that this was uh, a few uh, academic economists have done studies on how much cheaper it was to lend to one of these big banks compared to smaller bank or another company. It was worth about a third of a percentage point uh, for, for quite a while before this, this current crisis. The lenders thought that we are, our money is not at risk here. And they simply overwhelmed these companies with uh, resources, with uh, money that they could play with, take these uh, risks with, and the lenders were not providing any surveillance. I mean, they, they became like the old mom and pop depositor who doesn't have to worry that their bank is going to go bankrupt. But the difference is mom and pop depositors, they're not supposed to be looking at a bank's balance sheet and figuring out what risks they're taking. Big lenders are supposed to do that, and they had absolutely no market incentive uh, to do that. And they simply stopped doing that. They, they began to rely on this idea that the government would come in and save them. And yes, we saw failures, and we saw some losses to lenders as well. You know, the, the lenders to Lehman Brothers are, are still trying to figure out what they're going to get. Lenders to Washington Mutual also lost money. But this is not the consistent rule of law that functional financial markets need. This is kind of like, you know, a hawk picks out a pigeon every day and eats it, but the rest of the pigeons aren't scared because they know that this is just random. There's nothing that they can do about it, so they might as well not worry about it. You cannot have a system where once in a while some government official decides, gee, we're going to show everyone an example and not bail out the lenders. That is not a functional, consistent system that you can make uh, decisions on. Or, or based upon. Mm -hmm. And how, what was the relationship between that trend, between the too big to fail regime and what you called shadow banking or these exotic derivatives, exotic instruments? Both of them seemed to start in the 1980s. Both of them seemed to be ways of escaping the old system. Were they two trends that met up in a bad way for us or were they always connected? Uh, both. They, they certainly did meet up in a bad way in one way that uh, it was the shadow banking system, which is uh, hedge funds, investment firms, any firm that is not considered a traditional bank where you take deposits, you make long-term loans. The problem is that this investment world starting in the 1980s, it became the mechanism through which the economy got its credit. You know, you didn't go to the bank anymore and get a mortgage or a credit card because some loan officer thought you were a good risk. You went to the bank and got a mortgage because some uh, European investment firm or some hedge fund needed a mortgage security so that they could trade it on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, borrow tremendous amounts of money, and make huge profits based on tiny changes in the price of that security. So the old-fashioned credit markets became very, very dependent on volatile day-to-day -day trading 
And once all of that dried up, the shadow banking uh, system effectively vanished over the course of six months between March 2008 when Bear Stearns uh, needed a government rescue and uh, September 2008 when the government effectively stepped in and guaranteed everything in the financial system after the Lehman collapse, this shadow banking system just disappeared. There was no way for uh, the economy to, to go out and get credit. I mean, things like a company like General Electric borrowing overnight so that it could make its payroll these things went away because it had moved away from the banking system and gone into this inadequately regulated uh, investment side of the world. You argue that, uh, that we ought to have consistent limits on borrowing and that as much as possible the financial sector ought to be um, transparent and ought to occur on exchanges. Two questions about that. First of all, consistent limits on borrowing, different kinds of borrowing carry different risks. How consistent should those limits on borrowing be? Should there in fact be equal capital requirements for all different kinds of borrowing? Well, this, this is exactly the crux of it, that uh, different kinds of borrowing carry different risks, but we do not know what that is in advance. Uh, for example, going back 20 years, the U.S. regulators, along with the regulators of the rest of the, the Western world, they decided over in Switzerland that mortgage lending was almost perfectly safe, that it was inconceivable that you could see losses on triple A rated mortgage backed bond that was considered as safe, if not safer, than a U.S. Treasury bond. So the regulator said to financial institutions, you don't really have to, hold, have to hold very much capital down against these types of investments. You don't need to have a cushion against losses because losses are simply impossible, just like the guy said in 1926 about lending against the stock market. And what did the banks do? They went out and uh, they borrowed as much as they possibly uh, could borrow until literally there was almost nothing left, and they loaded up on these AAA rated uh, mortgage securities and mirror securities that had nothing behind them except for they tracked the value of these AAA securities so that they too got AAA ratings. And what happened? This was the government telling everybody to make the same mistake all at once. Uh, the economy can withstand financial firms making all different mistakes uh, at different times, but it cannot withstand the entire industry following a government decree. This is central planning of risk that comes from Washington and comes from global regulators and make the same mistake at the same time, there's, there's no way to withstand those losses. And that is why I think that we should move toward consistent capital requirements where even if something is rated AAA, it seems like there's no conceivable way it can suffer losses, you've got to put the same amount of capital down as you would behind a seemingly riskier bond and a seemingly risky, more uh, riskier industry because you really, either one could go bankrupt, but you just don't know which one it is in advance. And you're letting the financial industry decide what's risky and what's not, which is supposed to be its, its job. Uh, mm -hmm. Going back you know, in the 30s, the government did not say one stock is safe, you can borrow 90% against it, and another stock is not safe, you can only borrow 10%. They let the market uh, decide that. Mm -hmm. On the question of transparency, are you arguing that there ought to be no proprietary information? No, I, I certainly think uh, we need, banks need and should have pr pr proprietary uh, information. Uh, you know, there's a couple ideas out there that they should have to disclose what they hold once a week. I don't think that should be the case. I think the key is in aggregate, uh, if, a, if an institution has made half a trillion dollars worth of promises through the derivatives markets. It should have to do these publicly. The public should not know what institution it is, why they did this, what their reasoning is, uh, what their motive is, but it should know that this risk is out there, that someone has made a tremendous trade at this price. It is different than the price it was at last week. You can compare it to other financial instruments, other securities. The way it is now, there is absolutely none of that in certain markets because the banks just have the incentive to keep these things away from public markets where they have to follow old-fashioned rules. If a financial institution has to do a customized uh, derivative with a client, 
that is fine, but this should be the exception, not the rule, and they should have to hold a very, very heavy uh, cash down capital requirement be behind that so that it costs them so much money, it really has to be mm -hmm. economical for both them and the customer for, for them to do that. How central was the housing market to the financial collapse? People talk about the place of federal housing policy. Was housing, in fact, just, did it happen to be the spark that set off the, the problem that, that you describe having been building up for 20 years, or was housing really essential to the crisis? I think housing was central to the crisis because this was the perfect vehicle for a speculative mania based on borrowed money where the governments seemed to be the last, uh, last one to recognize that housing had become yet another speculative market that needed the same rules that govern other speculative markets. But the government had absolutely no motive or, uh, to recognize that this had happened because regulating housing would mean lower housing prices, every person in the middle class would no longer be able to think that he or she was a genius for buying a house at one price and sitting there and waiting it to, for it to go up to another price. Uh, we would have had lower home ownership uh, among uh, lower income people as well. The, both parties, uh, any ideology had the incentive to get as many people into buying houses uh, as possible and turned a blind eye to the fact that people were doing this with absolutely no cash down and leaving the banks and the financial system with absolutely no cushion for uh, tremendous uh, losses, even tiny losses. There was absolutely no cushion to absorb these. Okay, before we turn to the audience, a general question about the debate going on as we speak. Um, how would you briefly describe what the Dodd Bill does in relation to the problems that you laid out for us, and what should a regulatory reform do that the Dodd Bill doesn't do? Sure. Uh, the Dodd Bill is, we haven't learned the lesson that we learned in the 30s, which is humility, that we, the government cannot figure these things out. The, the Dodd Bill would give us 11 new regulatory acronyms. Uh, the, the biggest one would be the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is yet another uber regulator to uh, stand over all of the other regulators and try to uh, predict and prevent where the next financial crisis is coming from and look at b banks and other financial institutions on an individual granular basis and say which ones are taking too many risks, which markets are taking too many risks, and we will figure this out and uh, stop it from happening before it happens. We have learned over and over that this is impossible. We should treat all financial institutions the same. We should treat all financial markets uh, roughly the same. And when the mistake comes up, we will be able to have some cushion for the mistake that, that we never saw. They are doing the, the opposite of that. They are not creating consistent rule of law, they are creating a micromanagerial uh, financial system, even more so than we already have, where the regulators are telling the financial uh, companies and markets what is risky and what is not, and the financial uh, firms can very easily game uh, that type of, of system. And things like consumer financial protection uh, regulator, that is yet more micromanagement. The thing that consumers need protection from is too much debt. Too much debt comes from too big to fail financial industry. You can have all of the consumer financial protections in the world, but as long as you have these financial in companies able to borrow with a government subsidy, they're just going to lend that right back to people. Uh, it is simply overwhelming signal that you are getting from the government. If you had had a 10% down payment requirement on the housing markets, that would have been all the consumer financial protection that you needed in this bubble. People could, would not have had the 10% to keep up with housing prices, and it would have made all of these exotic mortgage products irrelevant. If you don't have the money, you're not getting an exotic mortgage. Let's see what questions we have out here. Um, I only ask that you wait for the microphone and tell us who you are. Yes, Clark. Mm -hmm. Clark Judge. Uh, one historical question, one uh, current one, or a uh, recent one. Uh, the historical one is that you're very kind about uh, the government in the 30s. This seems at odd, odds with uh, Amity Schley's uh, uh, 
characterization of how the government was operating in the 30s and its impact on the economy, where she finds it highly um, uh, punitive towards business and finance, and that that was a reason for uh, uh, one of the reasons for the persistence of the depression. A more current question, or cur question dealing with more current uh, issues. Uh, you say that uh, yeah, part of your argument rests on the uh, view of of uh, derivatives as customized products. Uh, that may be a current view, but at the t before the crisis began, uh, they weren't viewed as customized products in the sense that if you had a AAA rating, you were viewed as, your uh, derivative was viewed as comparable to other AAA products. It was the breakdown of confidence in those ratings that made the uh, derivatives seem uh, um, each different from the other and none of them uh, uh, comparable. Uh, it seems to me that's different than the way you've characterized things and leads to a different conclusion about where the crisis is. Could you comment on both? Sure, thanks Clark. I'll, uh, I'll take your first question first because you asked it first and because it's easier. Uh, I do not really disagree uh, that much, I think, with Amity's uh, general conclusions. I've read her book, enjoyed her book uh, very much. Uh, I am in complete agreement with Amity that the micromanagerial approach that President Roosevelt took to the rest of the economy was terribly damaging. I mean, things like, you know, Amity has her story about uh, telling uh, butchers that they have to work within thousands of pages of new code so that uh, you can create more jobs by essentially introducing inefficiencies to the economy so you need more workers. Uh, it is very odd, and I think maybe an accident, that Roosevelt took a very micromanagerial approach to the real economy and a fairly elegant let markets be market approach for the most part to the financial industry. And we see that the uh, political world basically sorted that out fairly well. It kept what was necessary and it almost immediately threw away the rest. I mean, these, uh, uh, not all of it, unfortunately, but the most draconian uh, attempts to manage the real economy disappeared fairly quickly through courts and through the political process and we kept the good parts of the consistent rules on the financial industry that really helped uh, ground the rest of the economy and made uh, the financial industry allocate capital fairly efficiently without uh, putting the rest of the economy at uh, uh, undue harm. And absolutely, your, your other point on that first question where it took the financial industry a long time to get used to these new rules. I mean, you, you had Banks complained that the FDIC was creating a new moral hazard, that uh, this, would, this meant that banks would just go out and be reckless because their depositors wouldn't care what they were doing that money. I mean, that was a real concern that the financial industry had. You had the stock exchanges balk at all of these new reporting and capital requirements. It took years and years for business to f finance to figure out that these rules weren't going anywhere. That to figure out how the government would go about enforcing them. And that was a long period of, of adjustment and in some ways uh, unavoidable. I mean, if, if we went to, and this segues into your, your other question, if we do get it into this uh, Dodd bill, which we should, that we should trade uh, most derivatives on public exchanges, that will mean a huge change to the financial world's uh, business model and it will mean short-term dislocations. But in my view, this is better for financial markets. It, makes, it will make the world confident again in American financial markets that these are markets, that they are deep, they are liquid, you can compare prices, the financial institutions are working for their clients. I mean, back in the 30s, the rules that we put in place, they helped America once it recovered from the Depression and got over the war become the, the global hub of the world's capital, partly because the world knew that we treated everyone consistently and fairly no matter who they were uh, or who they knew. And so the world wanted to put its money here. I think getting back to those rules would do the same thing uh, once we get uh, a recovery in place. And as for derivatives, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that the, the credit default swap derivative market 
which is just a way to sign a, a contract between one financial institution and usually another financial institution that if a, a mortgage-backed bond goes bust, the uh, purchaser of the swap will receive their, they'll, they'll receive their, the money of worth their losses back from the other financial institution. And companies like AIG uh, thought that these mortgage bonds were so safe they wrote insurance on these things through the swaps markets almost for free, and they could not make good on the insurance when the, the, uh, the bill came due. And I think the rules that I talk about, they would have meant AIG would have had to put some capital down behind these promises, even though they were rated AAA for uh, most of, of their uh, lifetime as a business, because the government would have said, even though you're rated AAA, we don't know what's going to happen. So you've got to put $50 billion down behind $500 billion worth of promises. This would have made people in the executive offices pay a little bit more attention to what these guys were doing in the, in the, uh, the exotic products uh, division. And it would have meant you, didn't, you would not have had Goldman Sachs and other institutions suddenly asking for all of this collateral that should have been put down before all at once when markets were already falling apart and destabilizing the system even more than it was destabilizing itself. Yes, right here. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi. Uh, Henry Canaday. As I understand your argument, all these bad eff effects flow through one pipe, and it's the uh, willingness or the expectation of the big lenders that they're going to be bailed out. Now, isn't a more elegant solution to that problem uh, something along the lines that Greg Mankiw has proposed, that all this big debt be convertible uh, from the beginning so that if it goes bankrupt, these guys know they're going to take a big haircut? Yeah, I think that that can be one of the solutions. Have uh, uh, junior debt that is converted into equity. I mean, Luigi Gonzalez, who also writes for uh, City Journal and National Affairs, has uh, suggested this as well. That can certainly be part of the package to make lenders, uh, to make it more credible that lenders will take their losses and there, there is a line where the losses will, will flow through the shareholders, the junior lenders, the senior lenders, uh, and so forth. That can certainly be a, a part of that. But I do think in the end it comes down to the fact that if the government is telling the financial institutions what is risky and what is not, if you don't put these derivatives on exchanges where the markets can see where the risk is, you will inevitably have another panic that overwhelms even that level of losses, and then you will see the bailouts for the senior lenders again. Would you separate banking from trading? No, uh, you know, and I, I think in the in the Dodd bill, uh, it, the the big point of controversy over the past week has been. Uh, Senator Blanche Lincoln, Democrat from Arkansas, she has, she's the head of the Agriculture Committee. Uh, agriculture has uh, jurisdiction over these derivatives because the, some of the first uh, and oldest derivatives were in cattle and in agriculture uh, products. So she, she has said, put the derivatives on exchanges and banks that have access to the FDIC and to the Federal Reserve can no longer do any business in derivatives, uh, more or less. And I think if you put them on exchanges, you don't need to do the second part. You've already protected the economy from the failure of these, these financial instruments, and so the banks can continue providing this service to their customers. And that is actually what they will be doing once you get them on, uh, on exchanges. It, they, the, these products will not be the same uh, fee factories that they've been for the financial mm -hmm. institutions, and they'll have to uh, innovate uh, elsewhere to, uh, to develop new profit lines, which is not an unhealthy thing. I think if you, uh, the FDIC Chairman Sheila Baer has said this uh, yesterday, and I agree, that if you just put derivatives somewhere else, you're just moving the risk, and regulators won't be looking at it anymore, and it's still posing a tremendous risk to uh, credit markets. We had a question up here. Hi, um, I'm Elon Moskowitz from The Motley Fool. Um, so, so it sounds like um, your solution is to um, provide transparency by getting derivatives onto exchanges and then um, to have higher capital requirements on them. Um, 
And that, that's, I think that's obviously necessary. Um, I'm wondering to what extent you think that's a sufficient solution. Um, so, for example, um, I mean, once we, if you have um, derivatives on exchanges with capital requirements, um, there could still be a problem where um, you have banks, um, uh, gaming regulators, for example, um, introducing new lo loopholes into legislation, um, or like you said, um, once they innovate into new product lines, they could find other ways to get into trouble. Um, and I mean, if you have a bank like a Citigroup or two times the size of Citigroup um, find a way to blow up, it would still have a lot of collateral damage to the system, and we'd still have to face the question of bailouts versus um, letting the letting the financial system collapse. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, is your solution to count on um, count on the the lost profit from derivatives to shrink banks, um, so that so that they wouldn't be too big to fail, or would you endorse um, a solution that would restrict the size of banks? I'm wondering, um, sort of that issue. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right that it uh, gives powerful uh, financial institutions uh, having a big advantage over regulators. Uh, with their knowledge, for one thing, having a big say in what happens in Washington. And I don't think we can chalk it up to corruption. I think it is just that the culture of a very sophisticated financial uh, uh, se sector was just unquestioned in Washington, that everyone thought that this was a good thing, that they had quantified and quarantined all risk uh, parceled off somewhere, so you didn't need the old-fashioned rules. Of course, they're always going to try to game that to get around the, the new rules, invent uh, new products to get around the new rules. But I think if we keep uh, our eye on certain principles that any speculative investment has to have some given percentage of, of cash down if, uh, you know, that is consistent within any asset class, whether it's a derivative, stock, a bond, you've got to have a consistent level of, of capital. When the banks have invented something else, those old rules should apply to that new thing as well. Same thing with disclosures of volume, of pricing. And you, certainly, uh, this do I think that we should have a size limit on banks? No, because I think once you fix the problem of lenders uh, thinking they're going to be bailed out, the banks will get smaller on their own and they will become less complex on their own as well. And the, the banks got big because we, partly because we developed this subsidy, they got bigger and bigger over time, they can gradually shrink over time as well. And I would consider that preferable to having a government decree to split these things up over the next five years, which will also add uh, economic uh, turmoil and in that case, I don't think the price would be worth it because you can see small financial institutions can get themselves in enough trouble now too through these uh, unregulated markets that they require bailouts. If you've got 10 small banks doing exactly the same thing because the government has inconsistent capital rules, that doesn't help you either if they all go bankrupt all at once uh, making the same mistake again. So I think uh, gradually create the, the fair playing field and the rules that allow for failure, the lenders will expect that failure and they will shrink the banks. Aren't there other advantages to the banks being large though that would keep them from, from shrinking as a response to this? Political advantages, for example, advantages in terms of the influence they can have? Uh, we'll see. Uh, the, you know, I, I think that that is the problem with 25 years worth of subsidy, that we really don't know what are market advantage, what are too big to fail advantages, what are political advantage. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic about the argument that, you know, complicated global businesses need complicated global banks uh, to, to serve their needs. You have uh, groups of banks that can provide lending. You don't need one big bank to provide a big loan. You can have boutique advisory uh, institutions that go back to what the investment world used to do and give 
less conflicted advice. So you uh, agree that, smaller banks would be better, but you think it's not necessary uh, for the government uh, to force that. Exactly. And we, we could have few big banks, few small banks. I mean, we have always had disparity uh, among the size of, of banks. It's only in the past uh, you know, two, two decades or so that we have gotten these uh, mm -hmm. mega global banks. And that's, I mean, that's not that it's not such a black and white issue. I mean, you have European banks and Asian banks that are still uh, yeah. going to be huge. And that's why I just don't think we should worry too much about the size itself. Let's take one more question, if we have one out there. Yes, in the back. Hi, Edward Roeder. Are you concerned that Congress may be unable to act, enact legislation that will be in the general public interest in regulating the institutions because so many of the key members, especially on the right committees, you mentioned Blanche Lincoln with uh, commodity futures, but also the banking committees get so much of their campaign money, not from their constituents, but from people who can't vote for them, who are in the financial community. And don't you think that creates the possibility that the only kind of regulatory reform they're going to really provide is one that keeps their benefactors in the financial community coming back to them for future jiggers in the law, which contributes to the problem we have where essentially we're running up the national debt by taxing the young and the unborn because they neither contribute nor vote. Do you, do you see the campaign finance system as presenting a weakness for American political will as that's presented to the world? I, I can't really speak to the complexities of campaign finance, but I certainly agree with you that they have, the financial industry has tremendous resources in Washington, and I think it goes well beyond the financial resources that the even, the more difficult side is just the advantage they have in knowledge that just like uh, the financial industry learned that there were huge profits in complexity because their customers had no idea what was going on and became completely dependent on the banks, the, many of the uh, congressional uh, offices, congressional staffers, it's the same thing. They have to rely on financial industry expertise to try to navigate how to put this bill together. And you, you really can tell that in, in the bill, that this is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the elected world still does not want to question what the financial world says. If the financial world says, hey, you do this and it's going to hurt the economy, elected officials believe that. And this is partly how we, uh, we got to where we are today, because they, the, the financial industry has the knowledge of these complex uh, instruments and how they nominally work on its side. And as long as they can keep that advantage, they can keep the advantage of the expectation of future bailouts. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, you Thank all. all of you for being here. Uh, if you haven't read Nicole's book, be sure you do. Uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.